Greetings. I am Tom Earl. I know you could be anywhere. So the fact that you are here today sharing your greatest gifts, your time and energy, it means the world to me. I hope you know that in this moment, you are valued, you are loved, and you are appreciated just as you are. My friends, I have a new series for you. This is called the Listening Deeper or the Re-Listen series. You can call it either one. I know I am. Now, you may have heard this intro before. We are using the same intro for this series. So have no fear if you're listening to this again and thinking, oh, I've heard this episode before. Don't worry. Same great intro. Absolutely amazing new podcast. So feel free to hit the skip 30 seconds if you've heard this before. But if this is your first time hearing this, welcome, my friends. What we have, we are presenting to you over these next episodes is really some deeper listenings or some re-listens to some of our most requested, some of our most listened to, some of my favorite episodes that we've done. Now, we have put out over 300 episodes since this has started. That means all the way back to 2016, I've put out one episode a week, every single week without fail since 2016. That means there's a lot of really awesome interviews, solo episodes. There's some really great things in there that you probably haven't heard if you're just joining us or even if you're a longtime listener. So what I want to do is pull together a number of my favorite ones and your favorite ones that you have listened to or that have been listened to before you. And I want you to either hear them fresh for the first time or give them a re-listen yourself. I'm telling you, I have re-listened to each of these and really just thinking about where I was in my life then or the wisdom from then that applies to now, because some of these are going to be from 2016. Some are going to be from last year. Some of them are going to be, you know, weeks before everything that went down in 2020. So I want to share these with you as a gift going into the time vault of our episodes. And really, I invite you to go through these with new ears, with new hearts, because we are new people here in this moment. Now, I invite you to let me know if you listen to it, what year do you think this week's episode was from? And I'd love to hear your thoughts. My friends, I look forward to sharing this listening deeper as we re-listen series with you. Let us jump into this week's re-listen. Here we go. Today, we are going to talk about five things to fast from. Now, I'm not sure if you're aware, but this marks the beginning of Ramadan. And it's a time for millions and millions of Muslims across the world where we become very introspective and reflective. And we start to go through the process, for those who are observing, for while the sun's up, so that starts about this morning, was 4.30 in the morning, So when the sun goes down, that's today about mm, 7.45, we won't be eating or drinking any water. In addition to not eating or drinking any water, we also abstain from things mentally. There's a spiritual component of reflection and prayer. Every morning what I do is I wake up uh, around 4.15, 4.10 to get some food, something to drink, And I journal while I'm eating. So I'm by myself. It's a time where I'm a little bit sleepy. So some of my my walls and barriers and things like this that are down because I'm just really relaxed. And I just journal each morning. First, I start by doing a free write poem. And then I conclude with a gratitude prayer where I talk to God about things that I'm grateful for. And so today, I want to invite you to consider over these next 30 days to join us in fasting from some things in your own life. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to fast from water and food and all of these other things, but what I'm going to share with you are five things to consider fasting from. If you read the show notes, you already saw some include things like self-doubt or overachieving or perfectionism, these kind of things. So that's what we're going to go through during this half hour or so we're together. Now, I want to say it's it's fun that we're doing a solo episode here, just me and you. 
I think for the past month or so, really this 2018 season, Year of Courage celebration has been a lot of interviews. And for me, it's just, a, I love the power of a conversation. I do enjoy getting to spend some time with you here one-on-one, -on -one, selfishly. But at the same time, it's really a pleasure to just learn from people the way they're living their lives and showing up as their best self. So I hope you've been enjoying that. I just wanted to take this time, just you and me, to start this month intentionally and to think about what are some things in your life that you want to release, that you want to let go of, that you want to just give an opportunity to, for maybe one day, for maybe one hour, for one week, just setting to the side and seeing how life is without them. Whereas I'm going to talk about here in a second, what if for one day you just abstain from self-doubt? Where when you started to go through that routine of doubting yourself, you're just like, nope, I have the out of, I'm fasting from this. Boom, you move out of it. I had done this this morning. I had asked somebody for some feedback. They emailed me that feedback. The feedback was super helpful, but I don't know if you've ever had that where you read feedback, even if it's feedback you want, and all of a sudden you start to feel, oh, you start to guess yourself. You start to question yourself. You start to hold on to that resistance. And I was going out for a walk, a very gentle walk since I'm fasting, and I realized I had some anxiousness within me. And I started to ask myself, where's this coming from? And I traced it back to that email. And I said, nope, today I'm fasting from self-doubt. So I accept the feedback. I'm implementing into my life, but I'm releasing this. I'm releasing that tension, that anxiousness, that questioning myself. I'm releasing it and I let it go. And it felt so good. So that's what we're going to go through today. Five things. It's very interesting for me to listen to where I was at last year. For all those people working to build a podcast or a following or building a business or a passion or anything that you're trying to grow, any habit, it's so interesting for me to listen back to even where I was a year ago because a year ago I had been doing the podcast for about a year and a half. So this was a year and a half in. I had thought I was pretty good back then. Listening to the episode again, I was thinking, holy smokes, you're going to hear it. I'm going to point it out so you can catch it. I say, you know, and different phrase connectors like that that I rarely say now. And I'm so much more relaxed in front of the camera recording to you. I feel I've gotten more conversational that it feels like we're in the same room right now. Whereas at the time, I had just switched from doing three-minute videos accompanied by a long-form audio to doing these 30, 40, 50 minute videos where I don't know if you've ever recorded one, but you're literally staring at yourself in the camera <laughs> and talking and at the same time trying to look at the eye holes so it looks like I'm looking at you, but really I see myself staring back at me. And at first when I started to record, I was almost performing for myself or I'd be trying to hype myself up and I can hear just a little bit of that in the episode last year, you might not notice it, but I listen to myself every single week to edit my episodes so I can hear the difference. You might too. So at, this, at the same time, the content I talk about, the five things to fast from, it's great. And I also share a story with you that I dreamt about and woke up and wrote it down and I share it. And I love the story bringing that back. But at the same time, it's really fun to look back and see where we're at a year ago, a year two years ago, if you have the Facebook thing that brings up the memories. So you can check out, hear how I've grown, and use that for yourself to know that anything you're gonna consistently work at and analyze and reflect on how you can get better, you will grow. And oftentimes, you don't realize you've grown until you look back at what you used to do, and you're like, holy smokes! <laughs> So without further ado, we're going to jump into this replay of this time last year. Five things I want to suggest that you fast from. Then I'm just going to come back in at the end and say peace and blessings to you. So here we go. You know, we always like to start in an intentional way, in a way that raises our energy. So if you could just sit up in your chair or if you're able to stand up and stretch for a minute, you know, we go through our day so fast and we rarely get a chance to just pause and reflect on our day and take a little break for ourselves. 
And as we always show, in just three minutes of checking in with ourselves, you can shift your energy entirely. So go ahead, sit up straight in your chair and breathe in nice and deep and then release. Ready? Breathe in and release. One more time. Breathe in and release. This time when you breathe in, When you go to breathe out, I want you to breathe out in a really fun, goofy, exaggerated way. Ready? Breathe in. And release in a goofy way. (laughs) Helps to have fun. So what I'd like for you to do now is, after we've breathed in in real nice, is close your eyes. I'm going to do the same. Close your eyes and think of a time in your life where something happened where you felt at peace. Think of a time in your life where you felt at peace. Maybe it was a time in nature or a walk or while you were meditating or a decision you made that brought you peace. Think of some time in your life where you felt peace. Next, I want you to think of when was a time in your life where something happened that made you laugh out loud? You laughed out loud. My go-to is always the Mindy Project. Something that happened there always makes me laugh. But right now I'm thinking of something that happened on Guardians of the Galaxy. So think of something that made you laugh out loud. Next, when was a time you were with friends, family, or somebody you loved, and it was just awesome? Think of a time like that. I'm thinking of my friend, she had a housewarming party recently, and it was just real nice seeing her so happy and being with a bunch of people who were awesome. Lastly, I want you to think of when was a time where you had a goal, where you set a goal, and lots of obstacles and things came in your way, but you pushed through it. You kept going. Think of that time. If you can't think of something, think back to maybe when you got your driver's license or a test you passed or... The first time you learn how to tie your shoes, something like that, okay? Take those memories with you. Breathe in deep one more time. Let out that breath and open your eyes. There we go. Two minutes, we were able to shift our energy just with our mind, thinking of something positive, thinking of something happened that made us joyful or laughed out loud. And that's the power of, our mind. That's the power of when we make a decision. And so what we're going to talk about today is what are six things you can fast from? F-A-S-T. What are six things you can fast from that can harness the power of your mind, harness the power of your discipline, and it'll bring you joy. And in case you've never heard this word before, fasting. Fasting is where you abstain from something, where you, you go without it. Um, You know, for instance, Christians during Lent, they fast from on Fridays from meat or like I said, as Muslims during Ramadan, which is our ninth month of the lunar calendar, we fast from food and water while the sun is up and then break our fast when it goes down. So in addition to food, we're going to talk about six things. So let me start with the story. So get yourself comfortable. This is a story I thought of this morning. So there was this young girl, her name was Fatima, and she was born in this magical place far, far away. So in Fatima's town, what was really honored, what people really valued was how fast you could talk. If in a 10 second period, you could speak as many words as possible, you were considered to be Super awesome. It's what everybody valued. People would come from miles around to hear people who could fit hundreds of words into a 10 second period and still do it in a way that was understandable. That was what was honored and where she was from. And unfortunately for Fatima, her gift was a little different. What she could do is within a 10 second period, she could pick five to six words, and each word would be so rich with meaning that she could express a thousand words in six words. Except in her town, that's not what people are looking for. They wanted lots of words in a short period of time rather than a few words. So her whole life as she was going through school and all of those things, 
Some people were mean to her and would bully her and tell her it's stupid, her, that she can't really fit in. And some people were just neutral, but she never really received encouragement except from her parents. And her parents would tell her, you can do this. You have something within you. Keep going. So even though she didn't feel like it was really anything that she could offer anybody, she kept practicing. And she would think of, what is a word I can use that can mean a lot of words at one time? And she would find these words. She would invent words. And she would just find a way to communicate in a way that was really concise. She could say five, six words in 10 second period that would just, it would blow your mind if that's what you were looking for. But unfortunately in her town, it wasn't. So she figured out when she got old enough, I can stay here and always feel like I don't belong. Stay in a place where my gifts, I feel like they're more of a curse. Or I can go out and learn. So she said, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna learn how can I speak a lot of words in a short period of time like the people in my town. She thought maybe there's somebody who can teach me how to do this because I just can't figure it out. So she left her town and she went wandering and she came to teacher after teacher and nobody could teach her how to do it. And while she was wandering to pass the time, she kept strengthening the gift she already had that she thought was a curse. And she arrived at this town where people were super friendly, so friendly in fact that they said, why don't you come meet the queen? So she met the queen. The queen's name was Queen Blue. So she was hanging out with Queen Blue. And Queen Blue said, you know, my people, they're super smart. They're super awesome, but they're unhappy. And they're unhappy because what we're looking for is my people, they like words that are rich. Words where one word has a thousand words within it. Where within 10 seconds, somebody could say five to six words and it would just blow our minds. That's what we're looking for. But unfortunately, everybody we find, they have this style where they speak lots of words in a little period of time. And Fatima thought, I think I can do that. And she found the courage and said to Queen Blue, you know, I, I think I might be your person, actually. So the queen got all the people together, the whole town. They got in this big arena and they said, go for it. And so she found the courage and she spoke a sentence out loud with five words that were just so much meaning in them. It was a language that wouldn't translate. Otherwise, I'd share it with you. And she spoke it and she looked out and people's faces were just crying with joy, and happiness. And for the first time, she saw that her gifts could change the world. And she looked to the queen and the queen was smiling at her. And from that day, Fatima would strengthen her gifts and she'd practice all the time. And every week she'd speak and people would come from miles around in that town and that city to hear her speak. And Fatima recognized that her whole life she was comparing herself to other people. And it made her suffer because she thought, if only I could exchange my gifts for theirs, if only I could be like them, then I'd finally feel good. When really all she had to do was travel and find a place where her gifts could be put to use. And she lived happily ever after. (laughs) How do you like my story? Because my story brings us to the first thing that we need to fast from, and that is comparison. We need to fast from comparison. I suggest you take 10 days and you do not compare yourself to anybody for 10 days and see what it's like. Brene Brown, she says, comparison is the thief of joy. Because often, especially now in a social media age where we're seeing other people's successes curated on an epic scale, we often find ourselves comparing ourselves to other people, especially when it's something that we're striving to. Like, let's say you're a musician and you're really striving to be a great musician and get yourself heard. And you see another musician, you know, put out a video and it gets millions of views and we can't help but compare ourselves and say, I should be there. or Why aren't I there? And often comparisons cousins are jealousy and doubt. And we start to think, oh, you know, like the jealousy thing. Well, that should be me or doubt ourselves. Well, why isn't it me? But just like Fatima, we're all on our own journey and we just need to travel. We need to go outside of ourselves and learn new things and see what inspires us and 
continue to strengthen our gift until you know one day we find that exact moment where it happens. You know, I was hearing the other day in one class I was in that we need to make sure that we believe that what we're after will happen while at the same time knowing that it'll be a journey. And so we journey through that while at the same time learning. This is what we got to do. So my friends, I want to suggest to you to take 10 days off from comparing yourself to other people. Give it a shot. The next thing is control. We need to take a fast from constantly needing to be in control. So if you've seen one of my videos on choosing peace over control, it was a quote from one of my friends. And a big time that I experienced this is during traffic jams, where I'm in a traffic jam and there's really nothing I can do about the traffic. But instead, I choose control over my peace. I get angry and I try to somehow think that by getting angry and agitated, it's somehow going to make the traffic split like the Red Sea. And so often I find that when I become agitated or anxious, it's because I'm trying to control a situation or a circumstance or a person where I have no control. And instead of focusing on what can I control, which is usually my internal state, my internal energy level. And, you know, this also comes to those of us who are leaders, who are activists. There's so much in the world that is going wrong that if we constantly try to, just with our emotions, project those out there and try to change, we're going to get burnt out. I know for me, when I first started to become awakened to what's going on in the world, I was 15. And I started reading more things, listening to political hip hop and punk rock and all this different stuff. And I started to see, wow, there's a different world than the existence that I'm living in. There are people who have different circumstances. And that was also right around the time where we invaded Iraq and I was just so upset and I started a website. I did all these different things. I was an activist at my school, but I had a lot of like anxiety because I felt like I wasn't doing enough and all these different things. And so my grandma, you know, she, she'd been there. She's lived through the Great Depression. She's lived through, you know, two world wars, all these different things. She's, has, and she told me, you know, that I'm going to drive myself crazy like this. And so she pulled me aside and told me, you know, what you got to do is if you want to make the world a better place, focus on the world around you. Make that world a happy place. In other words, focus on what you can control. And she gave me this mug, and I still have it to this day. And on the mug is the serenity prayer. And I'm going to read it to you just in case you haven't heard this. It says, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference. And so that's what I mean when I say let's fast from control. Is this right here? Is this prayer? Is to know the things that I can change and the things I cannot. And having the courage to change the ones I can, but the wisdom to know the difference. Because so much of our anxiety and our stress comes from trying to control that which we cannot control. And when we try to do that, it often makes us feel out of control. And feeling out of control can lead to suffering. So take a fast for the next 10 days. When you catch yourself getting anxious, you check, catch yourself getting overly stressed, follow it back like a rope and see what it's tied to. And I bet you'll find it's tied to something that you don't have control over. So consider that, fasting from trying to over control for the next 10 days. The next one, y'all ready for this? You knew it was coming. Social media. Take a 10-day fast from social media, except for, of course, my podcast. Don't fast from that. (laughs) I'm just playing. So social media is a magnifying glass. It's a magnifying glass in that it magnifies what we're already feeling, looking for, or our current energy level. So if I'm in a place where I'm feeling, you know, already feeling this first one, comparison, where I'm in a place where I'm comparing myself to others, social media is going to magnify that. You're going to have tons of people you can compare yourself to. Or if I'm feeling vulnerable or I'm feeling lonely, 
If I go on social media, it's going to magnify that. Same thing with joy. If you're feeling really joyful, you're going to find things on social media that make you feel joyful. But social media itself can become an addiction. So people talk about scientists are trying to figure out what scientifically makes it an addiction. And when I say addiction is that I have this one friend and whenever we go out to eat, I love being with her. But if I stop talking for a second, if there's a lull in the conversation at all, or if I even look away, or if I reach for the appetizer, anything like that, boom, the phone is out and looking at it. Or she has a million notifications on. So if any of her notification goes off, even if I'm in the middle of a heart-wrenching story, I'm like, this happened, and then, you know, this thing I never told anybody, oh, hang on, boom, the phone is out. And it's just hard, you know? And the thing about it is, I, I don't think it's even a choice anymore. I don't think that there's a conscious choice of, you know what? I want to know what's on my timeline. It's a, a need where it overrides your ability to make a decision. The phone comes out, I got to be on it. And so anything in life that's no longer a choice where it's, you have to do it. That's where people say an addiction. And there's no judgment on that. It's not saying you're a bad person because you're addicted to social media. So scientists are trying to figure out what about it is addicting. So you might have heard this where they say what they believe it is is this chemical called dopamine. And there's a lot of conversation about what is dopamine. So a lot of people used to say, well, dopamine is the happiness chemical or the achievement chemical. But they're getting a lot of clarity in that. What they're saying dopamine is is it's a chemical in your brain that's released when you seek something out or it's, re- it's a reward for trying to find something or trying to discover something. That's what dopamine does. So for instance, as we're developing as human beings species-wise, if you were to go out and try to solve a problem, dopamine will be the chemical that's released that rewards you and teaches your brain that, hey, when you go out and you search for food, I'm going to chemically tell you that it feels good so that you learn it's good to go search for food. It's that how many people here feel when you start something that you need to finish it? Or how many people feel if there's a problem that comes up, like let's say you get a phone call and somebody says, hey, this thing just happened. How many people here, raise your hand, feel like I want to solve this now. I don't want to put it off till next week. I want to solve this now. If you're one of those people that feels that, that's dopamine going off in your brain. You want that dopamine reward for going for it and closing the loop. So you go for it and you solve the problem, done. That's dopamine. It rewards you for seeking and then you, you, know, you seek and you finish it and boom, the reward is going off in your mind. So if that's what dopamine is, scientists are saying that social media is like a dopamine landfill. Because if you're seeking something, well, you can just go on social media and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and there's a never-ending amount of information. And it's also you put yourself out there. So you post something on social media. Well, now you've created the expectation or the possibility of something to happen. So let's say I post some post, right? Now there's a chemical going off in your mind that's anticipating that people might like it, that people might heart it, that people might reshare it. So that chemical goes off in your brain and then you start hoping and waiting chemically for people to like it. And each time they do, it reinforces in your mind chemically that this was a good thing. So now you're finding chemically, hey, I need that dopamine rush. And so boom, you post or you look or you're searching it through just social media. And that's not to say that dopamine itself is bad. Dopamine is totally essential to your life. Seeking is essential to your life. Just like social media is not, I'm not trying to paint it as all bad. But when it's no longer a choice, when anytime there's anything remotely awkward, like you're standing in an elevator or you're in a long line or anything like that, what we used to do is pause and think or pause and be bored. (laughs) Or pause and just deal with the awkwardness by head nodding to somebody. And all of those things are just as important as your life as going on social media. So we want to balance, right? The year of balance. We want to balance between having some times where you're bored 
or having some times where it's awkward with constantly having the escape of social media. So my suggestion is pick one day of the week. Mine is usually Sunday. Pick one day where you put your phone on airplane mode and you do not check social media at all. At all. You don't post. You don't do anything like that. Just try it. I promise you it's going to be tough at first, but you'll appreciate it. And if you really can, whenever I go on vacation, I have times of the year, about three, four times of the year, well, I'll take four days, like a Thursday through a Monday, and I'll put my phone on airplane mode for those entire four days. And at first, like, you go through a little detox, you're wondering what's going on in the world and all this, and you want to tell people how awesome it is to not be on social media. And then by the second day, the third day, the fourth day, it feels good. You don't have to wonder. There's you, And you also find that you get that dopamine reward by seeking other things like a book, like a conversation with family, like a TV show. And I know lots of people are going in hard on how terrible social media is. And that's not me. I love social media. Social media is a big component of how I share my message, of how I share my content. Without social media, we wouldn't be connected right now. So this is coming from somebody who loves social media. This is coming from somebody when People talk smack about young people or millennials or teenagers and say how we're all addicted to social media, how I give them a million reasons why they're crazy. But at the same time, we need to balance that and make sure that it's a choice. Make sure that when we go on social media, we're aware of, wait, why am I going back on even though I just checked it three seconds ago? Or how come I'm about to go to bed and I'm all relaxed, but at the same time, I need to really quick check my feed. Why is that? We need to ask ourselves those questions. And at the same time, we can learn that through fasting from social media. Y'all having fun? Go ahead and real quick, just do a little dance in your chair. Stretch it out. Do a little pump up. Yeah. Okay. And let's breathe in through your nose. Breathe in. And breathe out. They talk about how learning, if you do it passively, you usually only retain about 30% of what you listen to. But if you do something while you're learning, like right now, I just had you do a little dance, breathe in. So if continually while you're listening, if when I invite you to make sure your energy is in a good place, if you align good energy with what you're learning right now, then your brain will tell you by what you feel, hey, what you're trying to learn feels good. But if while you're listening to this, it's like "Mm, kind of passive, Then when you're like, hey, I want to go fasting. I want to fast from some of these things Tom is talking about. When you go to do those things, your body will remember, yeah, but it didn't really feel that good while I was listening, so why go for it? So that's why I invite you periodically, hey, let's raise our energy. And so I hope you take me up on that. Next thing, fasting from self-doubt. Fasting from self-doubt. Oh, man. Sometimes the things we say to ourselves within our mind, we would never say to somebody else out loud. Sometimes our self-talk is so mean that it's just like, man, why are we so hard on ourselves? And you know, two episodes ago, I talked about the different kinds of thoughts we have and don't believe everything you think. You can check that one out at tomrell.com slash think, T-H-I-N-K, tomrell.com slash think. It's worth checking out, talking about a lot of our thoughts aren't actually our own thoughts. They come from evolution, from socialization, from repetitive loops. And a lot of those lead to this self-doubt where we talk ourselves out of things before even going forward. We tell ourselves, Oh, it's not you. And a lot of that comes from some of these other things I've just talked about, about comparison, about from social media, comes from wanting to control things. And so fasting from these other things will also help with this one. But what if you went for something as if you had no fear? What would happen? What if you set a goal and just pretended, I'm going to go for this if I have no fear? You know, the other, not the other day, but about two years ago, three maybe, I think it was 2015, I'm going to link this article in the show notes, but there was a a journalist who decided to dress like Cookie Lion from Empire. She tried to do that for, I think, like two weeks. 
Um, if you're not familiar, Cookie Lion, she's from the show Empire. Super awesome character, dresses her own unique style, absolutely amazing. But you'd, she'd be described as somebody who has awesome confidence and someone who, no matter what she comes up against in business and creativity, she will push through it like a lion and she will make it happen. And she has this awesome confidence. So some, a journalist said, I'm going to dress like Cookie Lion for two weeks and see what happens. And so she did. And she found by dressing as this role model she had and trying to imitate her or role model after her confidence, she found she had more confidence in her own life. And she started going for things she wouldn't go for before. And so sometimes by just giving ourselves permission, by almost pretending we're putting on a play or we're assuming the role of someone else by saying, you know what, I no longer give myself for the next 10 days the out of self-doubt. That as soon as my self-doubt comes up, I'm going to say, nope, that's not even an option because I am fasting from it. Or if you hear yourself say something negative to yourself, you say, nope, I'm not even going to listen because for the next 10 days, I am fasting from self-doubt and putting myself down. If you just make that decision, eventually your mind will align with it because you've taken the option. There's a story, you know, when when the Moors went to Spain, they landed there, right? And they said, the, the leader said, um, you know, there's no going home, right? Because if you think of Morocco, there's the sea and then there's Spain. So they took their boats there. And when they landed on Spain, the general said, what we're going to do is we're going to burn our boats. And so they burned all the boats. And what did that mean? That meant that there was no option for retreat. We burnt the bridge that is our escape route. And so, of course, they won. And so that's a phrase you might hear. You got to burn your boats. And so when you remove the option, when you say, I will not self-doubt, I will not do this or that. If you say, I'm not going to do it, I'm going to fast from this no matter what, your brain will eventually align with it because you've removed the out from it. And so this brings me to my last one. Y'all ready for this? You might not be expecting this one. The last thing I'm inviting us to fast from is overachieving. I want to invite us for the next 10 days to fast from being overachievers. I learned this one. This is what brought the year of balance for me was that I was addicted to overachieving. I was addicted to always having to do something, to prepare, to set myself up for success in the highest way, to read the next book or write the next thing or this, this or that. I was always needing to do something. But what I'd never do, I would never relax. And so I read somewhere, I can't remember where, I apologize to the person for not giving you props, but I read that, you know, for the overachiever, it's not courage, we don't need courage to go for something else. Because to the overachiever, what comes naturally is going after the next achievement. But rather, what takes courage for the overachiever is doing nothing. What takes courage for the overachiever is relaxing. What takes courage for the overachiever is binge watching a TV show all day. What takes courage for the overachiever is just being lazy. And so I want to invite you to pick this month two days where you're going to fast from overachieving. Two days this month where you are going to disconnect from social media, where you're going to fast from trying to control everything, where you're going to fast from having to achieve and just relax and do a bunch of things that have no goal, no objective, nothing. You just get lazy, okay? (laughs) And you know what? That brings balance to your life. It brings relaxation, it brings clarity of mind, it brings new ideas. There are books written on the art of leisure, how without leisure, without boredom, new ideas can't be born because it's in that space of no thought. It's in that space of, oh my gosh, I'm kind of bored. There's nothing to do that you start to get new ideas, right? So my friends, this has been a brilliant and enjoyable time celebrating this episode with you and starting off Ramadan. Let me know, are you going to give one of these a shot? Are you going to fast from one of these five things? Let me know. Email me, tom at tomrell.com. I'm totally cool with you texting me too, 
37 or any social media at Tom Rallardis. Let me know if you're going to fast from any of these things. And if I could just add one more thing that I'd like to add is I'd love your feedback on how you feel the celebration is going. As I already mentioned, we're taking, we've been taking this in a new direction, been doing a lot of interviews rather than solo episodes and things like that. I'd love your feedback. What are some things that you'd like to hear about? Do you want to hear about things about activism? Do you want to hear things about business development, personal development, spirituality? Do you want some more one-on-one time like this? Let me know. What do you think needs a little bit of improvement? Any thoughts you have, my friends, would be super, super, duper, duper, gooper, gooper, looper, looper, Jupiter, Jupiter, doop, oh, we're back at the beginning, that was fun. <laughs> Helpful, that's where I was getting. So let me know, text, email, social, all of it. I want to thank you for listening to this week's deeper listening, re-listening series. I don't know how many more times I can squeeze in the word listening into this sentence. I want to thank you, as I shared in the beginning, for sharing your time and energy listening to this entire episode. As I said in the beginning, I'd love to know, do you know what year this episode was recorded in? And I'd love to know what stuck out to you. What moved you? What questions do you have? And if you have any suggestions for what you'd like future topics to cover or future guests we should feature. My friends, I look forward to you joining us again next week for a new episode in our Relisten series. And as always, I'm wishing you peace and blessings. Thank you. Oh, oh, one, one more thing. I'd love to continue the conversation. Feel free to join me at tomroll.com slash join. Subscribe below or let's connect on social media. Tom Earl Artist. Thanks again for watching. Yay.